the general agreement on trade in services which the EU is uh, a party to it's a subset of the World Trade Organization and the way it works is that the Union like every other signatory to the general agreement on trade in services tables sectoral requests to other countries so it asks other countries to open up its telecom sector or its energy sector or its financial sector whatever it might be to uh, to access for European firms and there's some kind of quid pro quo so for example in 2002 uh, the EU tabled requests to 109 countries uh, in a, a, a request that um, each <coughs> government open certain specified service sectors up to competition from EU firms. The, those requests largely originate from a group called the European Services Forum, which is a European business lobby group. So it's, very, it's an area where there's a very direct organic link between corporate lobbying and EU requests. As with most uh, trade policy, these requests were not initially made public, but they were subsequently leaked. And the World Development Movement analyzing those, a development organization analyzing those requests concluded that the EU's negotiating stance was targeting contrary to claims. It was actually targeting some of the poorest countries in the world. So for example, Mozambique had received six specific sector requests under that schedule. The EU was also, according to the World Development Movement, targeting countries where non-market-based delivery systems were in operation and the reason it was doing that was very straightforward because not-for-profit uh, service delivery whether public service or cooperative was obviously limiting the commercial opportunities available to European firms so for example Bangladesh's water sector had been targeted which is actually run by workers cooperatives um, likewise uh, sewerage services in the city of, uh, of Dhaka we just trying to be very specific uh, we are down to the nitty-gritty. We are down to sewerage in Dhaka here. Um, there was also, a, likewise, a kind of a general trend in the requests of an attack upon the principle of public service provision. The water sector in Honduras, for example, the state-owned water company, had actually performed successfully in recent years, but was being asked to open itself up to competition, potentially ruinous competition, from European water companies. Uh, actually, European water companies, and they're, they're largely French and British, Suez, Vivendi, um, RWE, Thames, SOAR, are, are quite significant players in this, and they tend to dominate the water sector worldwide. And water sector privatisation is a big issue in large parts of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It's actually a big political issue. It's been one of the driving forces behind the resurgence of left nationalism in large parts of Latin America, Bolivia in particular. Okay, part of what the EU was doing with those requests and still with these particular GATS requests was it was demanding that the, if, if a country enters into a commitment with the EU, it's a binding commitment. It's a treaty commitment, which makes it very difficult to reverse. So, for example, um, India in previous years was able to evict the now discredited en energy company Enron from the state of Maharashtra uh, for environmental and other reasons. Now... One of the arguments that critics make is it could be very difficult for a country to do that in years to come if it has entered into a binding treaty commitment to open up its uh, energy or its water sector to competition. Uh, there's also a, a general tendency towards trying to regulate, trying to limit countries' capacity to regulate foreign investment. So, for example, the EU asked Malaysia to drop its cap or its ceiling on foreign equity participation in its insurance sector, and it asked Brazil to end its restrictions on profit repatriation. So, you know, it's a reasonably it's a reasonably straightforward agenda, and it hasn't been it hasn't gone away. To sort of semi quote Jerry Adams, it hasn't gone away. You know, uh, the, the the World Development Movement later um, obtained further leaked documents uh, suggesting that in two thousand and five. The EU was proposing compulsory quantified service liberalisation targets at the Hong Kong World Trade Organisation that was taking place in 2005. They were seeking specific liberalisation commitments from developing countries in, again, across a whole range of sectors. So I think it's, it's probably the most startling example in many ways of a very ambitious and very far-reaching um, drive towards liberalisation 
I use the word liberalisation cautiously here because, in a sense, it's not it's not entirely about liberalisation. Yes, it's about opening these markets up to foreign competition, but it's also about locking in the policies to make sure that other governments can't change them. So there's an element of opening up, but also closing down simultaneously going on here. That, by the way, and I don't want to get into a huge theoretical discussion, I think it's a mistake that we sometimes make when we talk about neoliberalism. Uh, we think about it as being a pure free market agenda, but it's not. It, <clears throat> it actually involves very, very active state policing in order to make sure that the agenda is locked in place.